Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did supposed fail to, her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of JJ and this Yobi, who is Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Coming up, Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling rages at Scotland's new hate crime laws, daring officers to arrest her as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak backs her right to free speech. Plus, the Princess of Wales was reportedly forced to reveal her cancer battle after Kensington Palace learned that the news had possibly been leaked. And a new TikTok scam sees Albanian gangsters targeting pregnant women to help bypass the UK's asylum system. Good evening, Britain. Good evening. And welcome to the Independent Republic of JJ and this Yobi right here on Talk TV. I'm holding the fort whilst Mike's away. And boy, have I got a show for you tonight. Find out who a group of Tories want back as their leader. You're not going to believe it. The BBC come under fire once again. This time, it's in relation to disgraced presenter Hugh Edwards. And why a teenager is losing the ability to hold a conversation in person. You're watching my Independent Republic. Let's kickstart the show. The SNP is in hot water after passing its hate crime bill, which critics on both sides of the border say is a huge danger to free speech. Adding fuel to the fire is author J.K. Rowling, who has dared the SNP and Scottish police to arrest her if her social media posts and views on trans people are in breach of the bill. Labour is now under fire to make a comment after Rishi Sunak has seemingly taken no time in siding with the legendary children's author, announcing people should not be criminalised for stating simple facts on biology. Joining me in the studio to discuss this is The Sun's deputy political editor, Ryan Sabe, political analyst, Mike Indian, and author at The Spectator, Paul Burke. Ryan, what exactly is the hate bill and why are people so against it? I think it basically comes down to the, the fact that you cannot describe people as, uh, well, the way that JK Rowling would say, she cannot express the way that she wants to describe people freely and how she sees fit. And uh, I think the hate bill was obviously introduced by the, uh, the, the Scottish Parliament um, last year. And, um, yeah, you have critics like J.K. Rowling have been speaking out about it. And uh, she obviously decided to create her own April Fool, um, so-called April Fool, yesterday. And um, the police have actually said today there's absolutely no way that she's going to get prosecuted. Um, they're not going to press, um, go, go forward with any sort of proceedings with that. And, uh, she, yeah, she, she, she is in the clear, and she would say so, rightly that she's in the clear. Yeah, well, Mike, if, uh, if, what, if J.K. Rowling calling someone who identifies as, as a trans woman or woman full stop. She calls them a man, and the police are saying, that's not in breach. What is the point of this bill, then? It's a very difficult law to say, because obviously the UK has some of the most comprehensive, of courses legislation in the world. All the characteristics which listed under the hate crime bill are protected characteristics under the Equality Act, which means that, you know, any sort of meaningful discrimination cannot take place against them. Crucially, women are left out of this, actually. You mm -hmm. know, biological sex isn't actually included under it, but transgender identity is. One of the things I find really interesting about this, JJ, is that... We're having the prime minister said that he wouldn't comment on individual matters, but then he went and did that immediately. And of course, this year we saw this during the last conservative leadership election. It almost became a bit of a shibboleth for every conservative candidate to say, "I believe a woman is a woman." And it was similar with the Labour leadership as well. I do wonder how much this resonates with the wider public as well. But the SNP have clearly picked a fight with this bill as they did with the um, gender recognition reforms they pushed through um, last year. Uh, do you think uh, well, you've got Sunak coming out and saying, "Saying, yeah, express what you want to say." But do you think Starmer's going to have the, the balls, Paul, to come out and say something similar? Or is Starmer just going to probably ignore it and fade into the background? I think he'll try to ignore it and hope it will go away. But we've already seen his um, difficulty in identifying what a woman is. He knows so, now, apparently. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> He's he sort of got to because I would contend that most people are on the side of J.K. Rowling. Mm. And Starmer wants to be on, on the side of most people. That's his thing. So I imagine he will uh, 
line up behind Rishi Sunak. But Ryan, it's a bit rich of Sunak to be saying we should have free speech because if you ask Harry Miller, Caroline Farrow or Kelly J. Keane, a.k.a. Posey Parker, they've all found themselves targeted by the cops because of stuff they've said online during his tenure. So it's not as if down here, past the border, past the wall, suddenly it's, it's all cool in England, you can say whatever you want. We have, we're, we're pretty strict on, on the thought police here too. Yeah, totally. And I think the, the freedom of speech thing comes down to uh, the, like, you know, J.K. Rowling and the like being able to express what she thinks about the state of biolog biological men or women. And she feels you know, extremely strongly about it, so much so that she said, you know, if you, you know, when she, she's currently out of the country, if she comes back to, back to Scotland or Edinburgh where, where she lives, you know, come, come and arrest me. And, yeah. um, and, I, and I think that's one thing that she, a key message that she wants to get across. That, and also one other thing that she mentioned today, she said that she's not going to get, uh, you know, be involved in any sort of criminal investigation. If someone else says that, who's not high and mighty or powerful, has lots of money that can defend themselves, mm. she said that she'd repeat exactly what someone else would say and, you know, come, come for us all. So she is, you know, re she's really digging in but she, she feels very strongly that she's on, you know, on the right side of the law. And is it really that, you know, you know unless it's an ex extreme, extreme case, are the police really going to act on it? Yeah, look, I understand. Trans people, they are targeted, as, as plenty of groups, minority groups are on social media. But there's, there's a difference between saying, calling someone a man and saying something that is just actual vitriol and, and, and is going to incite violence against them. Isn't that right, Paul? Yeah, I mean, it, it's... I, I think that people can... They don't really care what they call themselves, but they don't own the English language. And I'm always, I am always find it odd that people want to be called they. It's like, <laughs> I am greater than one person. <laughs> I am more than that. Uh, if you were that bothered and you didn't want to be male or female, call yourself it. But they don't like that. Oh, they don't like <laughs> no, that. No, no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't no. advise that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise, advise that. that either, but I'm, it's... it's, it's there, aren't there other things? It's not as though Scotland hasn't got any other problems to talk about. I, I really can't believe that anyone's even bothered with this, given that there are economic and social problems affecting not just Scotland, but the whole of the UK. And that's what our governments need to turn their attention to solving. Well, Mike, under this new bill, technically speaking, even us having this conversation could, could land us in trouble. Well, that's a good job we're not off the border in, isn't it? <laughs> but remember, we can't let the Senate government off that lightly. This is the government that's trying to pass the freedom of speech bill relating to universities. So this, there's this big issue. There's a, the macro issue here is that there is are people on both sides of the political spectrum who are trying to recast what freedom of speech means in higher education settings, in the mainstream media. The issue becomes is when we live in an age where people can publish virtually any opinion online, if you want to try and find a view that corroborates yours, no matter how spurious it may be or how well-founded it may be, you can usually find a wealth of people just willing to back that sheer, that sheer volume of, a bit of opinion, not necessarily by depth of it as well. And it's testing the limits of democratic society in that way. And I, I'm very wary of any sort of law or regulation that seeks to set things around that. When the public order was passed in the 80s, you know, creating an offence for inciting on racial basis, there, was, there were very well-founded reasons for that based on the situations we'd seen in the 80s, the Brixton riots, and well, for that previous, everything since the Windrush generation came to this country. However, now I start to wonder if these things aren't necessarily just simply political items in, a, in an escalating culture war. And I'd hope that, as Paul says, that the, the governments in Scotland and London, Cardiff and Northern Ireland would focus on the real practical issues like cost of living and ensuring that we live in a society where, yes, people can express themselves, but we're not getting overly sensitive about the minutiae of language. Well, right, as I understand it, even if you're not charged, the fact that someone complains about you to the police means you can have something recorded against your name. Um, so J.K. Rowling, she may say she's going to fight it, whatever, she's got the money to, but she could still end up having... So, so having get sorry Ryan cause you're talking about having anything um, recorded against name as could any of us if we were going to go in, into Scotland and say those things whilst we're there. I, th I think you probably could. Yeah, technically it could be recorded against your name. Whether it's going to be, it would, probably wouldn't count against you. Obviously, it's not. A, it's not a conviction. Or but you know the police can refer back to that um, at a later date. So. I think that's, you know, it's not particularly helpful for the, for, for the individual. You know, you think you probably have a, a clean record, but ultimately, um, deep down, if you go look on, you know, police records, that, you know, the police look it up, uh, you won't do. So there is that slight distinction, but I think in the main you would still be clearer, just be, you know, a slight blemish, you know, within yeah. the police. Paul, you said you don't think the public care that much about it, but surely these kind of laws are only going to be discussed and put forward because people are trying to win votes. The, the, the politicians aren't going to put, this, put something forward that's so unpopular, people are going to be like, what are you doing that for, mate? Um, I, I do think that I think um, that concentrating too heavily on this is, uh, is going to be a vote loser for anyone. It's not that uh, there aren't issues within 
gender that need to be discussed, but I think, as we're saying, that there, there, there's the cost of living, there's, oh, just uh, security, there's a war in Russia, there's Gaza, there, there's all these other things that really do concern people. Education, and top of the list is probably the NHS. Um, really? Mm. You know, it, 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 it's something, but I, I think, especially, especially with an election coming along, you know, I, I always thought Sunak, or for that matter, Starmer, have got the easiest opponent they'll ever have. They've just sort of come out and say a few, make a few good, strong promises. Yeah. I'm not being sort of left-wing or right-wing, but something that resonates with the public, and neither of them are doing it. Yeah. And they're getting close to, a, to an election and still talking about stuff like this. Well, Mike, let's move on to uh, the Popcorn group. <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> Popcorn. <laughs> um, so the, the, talk, the Popcorn group of tours want to install a Liz Trust star leader. My first question is, what is a Liz Trust star leader? So this is someone who's drawn from the sort of IEA free market, more libertarian wing of the Conservative Party. They're grouping what's one of the so-called five families within the Conservative <laughs> Party that call, that call themselves the New Conservatives as well. So the most publicly aware members would be probably Simon Clark, who was Liz Truss's levelling up secretary, people that served in cabinet positions for all of five minutes under her, <laughs> and took her leadership win in sort of the latter bit of 2022, that those heady 45 days as a mandate to pursue a radical tax cutting more free market Thatcherite agenda. Uh -huh. And of course, this, this is symptomatic of, of, of a political party that's facing uh, an election defeat and a long spell in opposition, that they tend to tack to their extreme. We saw it with Labour under Corbyn. They moved very firmly to the left of the, of the party. Mm -hmm. And the Conservatives are now looking to move even more. I mean, Brevin Rishi Sunak is himself a Thatcherite. You know, a lot of the stuff that Liz Truss would advocate for in moderation, he would agree with. But the scale and speed of it and the depth to which they went to, £45 billion pounds worth of ta unfunded tax cuts, which was in that, was in that mini budget, was something that was un, basically unforeseen. And it, at the time, it really did spook the markets. And that also it combines with the sort of populist tendency to have a contemporary institutions like the Bank of England, like mm -hmm. the, um, the OBR as well, the civil service. So in opposition, this sounds like very fertile territory for a Conservative Party that if you look at, for example, the poll that was in the Sunday Times at the weekend, reduced to 98 seats. Interestingly, the kind of scheme that they're centred on, this is the idea they can install Pretty Patel, Boris Johnson's former Home Secretary, in, is, as the leader, that they say they could win the support of 70 Conservative MPs. And they, if, that's, if that's the level they're building towards, they're anticipating the, the party being decimated from its current level of about 350. So yeah. they're, they're, they're basically admitting they're heading for a heavy election defeat. Ryan, why would the Tories, the grassroots voters, why would they want to have um, anyone who's associated with trust? She nearly crashed the economy. Well, I think you go back to that leadership election campaign um, over the summer of 2022. They're the people who elected her, so they feel like they are akin to, 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 her, uh, to her values. And you always, if you are going to try and win uh, the, the, a leadership contest, you have to try and you have to play almost to, to their, their strengths. Rishi Sunak warned um, everyone about what would happen to the economy if they went ahead and chose yeah. Liz Truss. You had all his supporters, Dominic Raab at the time, you know, I could, you, you know countless others, um, saying, you know, be aware. Yeah. But they still, they still back, back them. So that's what the Conservatives are just going to go through this, you know, you know, bonfire of ideas, as it were, just yeah. trying to come up with, try and find something um, from the ashes after after this, you know, probable election defeat whenever whenever that happens. So. Yeah, that they, they, you have to, you know, you're, you're playing to different audiences. You've got the wider public, you've got the parliamentary party, but you've also mm -hmm. just to get there and put your ideas forward, you have to win over the party membership. I just find it bizarre that anyone would want to have um, a leader who lasted less time than a lettuce in charge. You know, <laughs> bizarre, but at least they're progressive. They've got, they've had, a, they've had a few females in charge. But there's a lot of it. A lot of it is to be said that they, you know, a lot of her ideas, whether you know, on planning reform, childcare just didn't warm the markets up well enough, didn't yeah. warm the public well enough. enough. So you, it's the sort of thing you do over maybe a few years, not That's 10 minutes. Fair. Yeah, yeah. But as I say, they had lots of women in that party and they've got women in prominent positions. Unlike on this show, there's no women on our panel tonight. That's how we <laughs> like it, just the boys. Anyway, <laughs> you are watching The Independent Republic of JJ. Up next, the 150,000 funded childcare places up for grabs and kids' social skills crippled by technology. See you in just a minute. Radio online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are a biological man. Trans woman. 
It's not a woman. A trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ and this Yobi. Now, Rishi Sunak says the government is delivering on its childcare plan despite criticism from the opposition. Parents of two year olds across England can access 15 hours of taxpayer funded childcare each week from this month. The policy is the first phase of a plan to dramatically expand funded childcare for working parents. The Prime Minister says it will, be, it will build a brighter future for families and help to grow our economy, but Labour says families will struggle to access places. Let's bring in the brilliant journalist and broadcaster, Afia Hagen, now. Afia, do you think these plans are too ambitious for my Prime Minister? Well, the thing is, if you have put in place the nursery places that are needed for this infrastructure, so if you've expanded across the nurseries, if you've funded the nursery places, as in, you know, built more nurseries, enabled more nurseries to be able to expand the free childcare places, then this is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that that has happened. So therefore, there's going to be a mad scramble for these three places, they're gonna go very quickly, and then everyone else just has to pay, right? Yeah. And childcare costs at the moment are just so expensive. The highest in Europe, you know, in countries like Canada, childcare is like $7 a day. Whereas here, you've got people, I mean, I remember when my daughter was in childcare for three days a week, that costs more than our mortgage. Mm. Just doesn't make any sense. So you've got people who are being priced out of the market. If you don't have the infrastructure of grandparents or the village that it takes to raise that child, mm. then childcare is, is so massively expensive. Now, if the government were really serious about this, you would have expanded the childcare, childcare places first and then said, okay, now we've got free childcare in place for one and two year olds, 15 hours a week. But that hasn't been done. So it's gonna be incredibly difficult to access. This feels like electioneering to me. This feels like the government saying, have this, have this, have this. It's like Oprah Winfrey, you have a car, you have a car, you have a car and you have a car. Um, just before the election, this is how we get you to vote for us. Uh, but it's not been properly funded, infrastructured. I just don't believe it. My kids, my kids in nursery currently, 
it costs me two thousand pounds a month. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, isn't it? it's mental. So I can fully understand why some people would just rather not work and stay at home with your yeah, kid. Absolutely. That is in itself still going to be a cost to you of having to do activities and take mm -hmm. them out to do certain things. And also remember, you will have some really, really brilliant minds who are out of the workforce, who are literally priced out of the workforce because it doesn't make sense for them to work. So these people are staying at home and doing the incredible, incredible job of raising children. And by the time they decide to go back to work, if they do decide to go back to work, when it's much easier when your child's in school, you've perhaps been out of the workforce for four mm. or five years. Mm. So you're starting, you know, almost starting again with the way that things move so quickly. Yeah. So what's in place to, to get great people back into the workforce after they've done this incredible job of giving five years of their life to their child? So we've, we've got a uh, problem with ageing in this country, as in there's more old people than there are young people. Mm. So we're supposed to be trying to encourage people to have more babies. We can't, all, we can't afford to have kids can't. in this day and age. And on top of that, you're then going to say, well, it's £2,000 if you're in central London for a decent nursery. Maybe it's cheaper out in some of the, uh, in the rest of the country. But how are we going to reverse this to make it accessible for everyone? And that's a really good question. I think the government, and this is the government now and the government's come post-general election, need to realise that the childcare sector is massively overpriced, but massively underpaid for the people who are actually in it. Nursery nurses are earning minimum wage, if that. The nursery managers are driving around in Bentleys, and I say that because my, my child's nursery manager actually had a Bentley. <laughs> and I knew that I was paying for it, and it really stuck in my throat. But, you know, the childcare sector needs to be much more mass much more better priced for the people that are paying into it, uh, much more better funded for the people that actually look after our children, and much more accessible. You shouldn't be penalised for having children in this country. And that penal comes from the cost of childcare. So that sector needs to be radically overhauled in the way that it's funded, in the way that we pay for it, and make it much cheaper, much more accessible for people. Because people are literally saying, and I have friends who have said, I just can't afford to have children. I can't afford it. Yeah. I cannot afford to have children. Mm. If you're not two parents, you know, earning two really good wages actually doesn't make sense for, for to send your child to nursery if you're going to pay the same or more than your mortgage. It yeah. doesn't make any financial sense. Well, look, Sunak will say that um, they've made it easier to, to become a childminder. We need more childminders. It's not, yeah. not, not just kids going to nursery, but childminders is part of this as well. Mm -hmm. They've made it easier to become a childminder. They're giving out a thousand pound, like a golden handshake to people as well to try and get them in, into the industry. So they're going to say that actually they're, they're doing the right thing. And in September, it goes from two year olds to being, I think nine month olds can get this free, free childcare too. Free childcare, that's great. Have they made sure the places are available for people to access? There's no point in saying, look, JJ, in September, September 1st, you can have a free car. There is no car for me to give you, <laughs> but it will be free. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> That's a good point. Can we trust the, the same government who have basically uh, destroyed our NHS <laughs> with mismanagement and, uh, and, and poor spending? Can we trust them to look after our kids? They can't look after the sick. They can't look after our older people either. Look at the state of adult social care. Mm. We, we cannot trust them to look after our kids. We cannot trust them to look after grown-ups who need it as well. We cannot trust them with the NHS. We can't trust them with anything. And I think that has been proven over the past 14 years. Now, I'm not saying that we can necessarily trust a Labour government, but maybe give someone else a chance to mess up. Well, look, let's move on to teenagers, from babies to teenagers. Yeah. So what's the story here? That the that computers are bad, phones are bad? What, what, what is this? <laughs> Always doom and yes, gloom. Yes, there is so much doom and gloom. <laughs> so basically, uh, there's some research that's come out in America that says that teenagers are having difficulty holding conversations with people because they spend too much time in front of their screens. At higher rates of depression and anxiety are coming from mobile phone use and I think specifically social media as well. And so basically, yes, Phones are bad and are rotting our children's brains. That's what we are being told. <laughs> is this surprising? No, it's not surprising. But you know what you know what needs to happen is parents need to parent, right? Yep. Parents Number need one. to parent. You need to be really aware of how much time your child is spending on your phone. My daughter, she has a smartphone. Um, and it's useful sometimes, but also you have to I make sure that I put the limits in place. It's enough now. 
you know, we're going to put it down, we're going to leave it at home, whatever. And I must admit, actually, when I was reading this story, I thought to myself, I really hope she doesn't go down this road. But I thought back to how she is with her phone. And actually, over this weekend, she has not really been around her phone at all. She's really been into family activities. And lots of people say to me, oh, you know, you're lucky your child still wants to hang out with you. That's because I'm fabulous. <laughs> but, you know, right. you, you, but, <laughs> but you'll find it's not. But you really need to parent that child. Children are going to use mobile phones. They're going to access social media. Yeah. That is a given. And it's the same as our parents saying to us, you watch too much TV. Yeah. Spot in your brain. Play. Get outside and play. Playing too same, much. Same. You know, Amstrad. Do you remember them? Yeah, Amstrad, yep. Commodore, Atari. Exactly. Playing yeah. too much computer games, downloading too much music on LimeWire legally. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's just the next thing that we need to be aware of and we need to parent of. But this is the thing is that if you are just going to let leave your child with the phone, mm -hmm. then, yeah, they're going to lose their social skills. I mean, I don't think they should be having Oh, are they losing their social skills? Because I tell you, the kids I see hanging around in the high street, they have no problem talking to each other. That's true. And spitting on the floor and smoking what I presume are dubious cigarettes oh, at best. I wouldn't know. They can talk, they can talk <laughs> to each other fine. Is this, is this not just not another case of kids going into the workplace and not knowing how to talk to older generations? We were the same when we were that age. Teenagers don't like speaking to older people. Yeah, of course. Of course. But that's, again, where the parenting comes in, right? We cannot expect our kids to learn everything from school or, in this case, learn everything from a phone. We as parents have to be aware of what they're doing but also help them develop their social skills. Uh -huh. I think in America, this study was around, like, 19 to 20-year-olds. But let's remember that those kids were kind of, like, 15, 16, going through the pandemic. Pandemic. Don't and talk I th about the no, lockdown. No, no. All I hear is people I, using that as an excuse I, all the time. But I think that that period of time had a massive effect on young people that is manifesting now. And I think that's a real thing. It's always an excuse. Always an excuse. It's a reason. Blame the pandemic. Blame Brexit. <laughs> blame, blame, I just, do blame just, Brexit, just blame to be bad honest. Parenting. Yeah. Um, Nokia's being given out to kids instead of smartphones, dumb phones, some people call them. You remember the old bricks? You had snake on it. Exactly. Would you give your daughter that phone? Because I've, I've been out with you and your daughter, and I remember showing me some videos you wanted to post on social media, and I said, no, you're not posting. I can see your yeah. belly button. You're, you're not, not posting doing that. that. You're Delete not doing that. that. Is that, are you going to give your kid a Nokia brick instead? That you know would be a better though? idea, wouldn't it? Those are quite retro and quite cool, plus the battery lasts forever. Ever, which is amazing. <laughs> and they had the best ringtones and you could change the faces. I think I might I think I might get one myself actually. There's no WhatsApp, there's no apps. They don't need any of that. You're right, they don't need what? Well, well Just then ring me. Well then there we go. Your daughter, yeah. Nene, is gonna get a Nokia. Yeah. And I'll she can get a 3210, I'll get a 3310. <laughs> we'll just be calling each other. Let's move on to um sticking with kids, but move on to drugs and not the ones that I see all them kids choking on outside saying on the high street. This is nearly half a million. Uh, kids apparently are on antidepressants. Uh, nearly half a million uh, prescriptions were given out just last year and then this, mm -hmm. again this year. Experts warned we've created a generation of lost and lonely young people. I get mental health is a thing. I, I've, I see a shrink. I've suffered with depression in the past. Mm -hmm. But I also think that today our kids, are, they're too soft. There's no resilience in them. Everything for them they can't get, up, get out of bed to go to school. So they're scared of being teased. You can't give them criticism because of their mental health. I think there's a fine line to tread here because there we go. We, no, 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 no. Careful. There's a fine line to tread here because, like you so rightly said yourself, mental health and being aware of our mental health is a real thing. But we do need to parent, like I said, when it comes to the mobile phones, and teach our kids about resilience. We need to hear them and we need to hear what they're saying when they say that they are sad, depressed, when they are having a difficult time getting out of bed, interacting with people. But of course, the resilience that we put into them, how we parent them is a huge part of them being able to go forward in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I, um, me personally, when it comes to things like antidepressants, I mean, I would rather if it was, if it was my child and uh, she said she was having some difficulties, talking therapies and things like that. But obviously, medication works. And, that, and that's a great thing. Yeah, but you know, what, you know what else works? Parenting. It does. Parenting and talking to your kids. It does. Yeah, 100%. that works. That works Can't best. It worked for you, for you and it worked for me. Yeah. And it's going to work for this Generation Z. The lazy, <laughs> you love them. Lazy losers. <laughs> uh, Freya, don't go anywhere. Stay with me. You are watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Torrid Times for the Palace has revealed the threat of a leak that have been behind the sudden announcement of the Princess of Wales's cancer diagnosis. All that and more in two. See you then.
Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> even, <laughs> for, yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ. Sources have claimed that the threat of a leak was behind Princess Catherine revealing her cancer treatment to the nation. Kensington Palace reportedly rushed to get ahead of the news and reveal her diagnosis after the princess's medical records were reportedly accessed by an unknown person. Still with me here in the studio is royal commentator Afia Hagen. Afia, I went on the talk mm -hmm. last week. Mm -hmm. At some point, the talk, 6 p.m. till 7 p.m. Yeah. Weekdays. There we go. At some point last week, I went on the talk and I said, um, I don't think Princess Catherine wanted to tell us this, this news about the cancer diagnosis. I think something prompted her, whether it's because of all the conspiracy theories and the bad press the royal family were getting, um, about whether it's really her or not, or, or whether there's another reason, I don't know. But I don't, if she wanted us to know this, I think they'd have, they'd have handled it differently than the past few weeks. And I got absolutely slammed on social media. How dare you say that about Princess Catherine? Let her live her life, blah, 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 blah. But turns out, actually, I was correct. Now, I think to be honest, that the Princess of Wales probably would have preferred to tell the wider world what went on with her and her cancer diagnosis when she was ready to perhaps do some campaigning around it when she was back as back working mm -hmm. in the public sphere. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that in the week leading up to her announcement, we did have the story of someone trying to uh, breach records at the London Clinic, accessing her private information. And then we found out more about her health issues a few days later, literally. I don't think that, that that's a coincidence. Now, it's thought that this data breach perhaps happened in January. Why were we being told about it in that 
in that particular week of March. Oh. Why were we finding out like six to eight weeks later? Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's a coincidence. Now, we do know that because of her three children, Charlotte, George and Louis, that she wanted to take the time to tell them when she was good and ready. And that was towards the Easter holidays to let them know so that when they, she told them when they were on Easter holidays, then they could take time as a family to process that information. But in terms of telling the wider world, I think I do agree with you that she probably would have liked to have waited, but there was a certain amount of pressure. And I don't think it was actually because of all the conspiracy theories on social media. I think it was probably because of this data breach more than anything, that their hands were forced in some way. Perhaps, and I don't, I don't know this as a fact, but mm -hmm. perhaps there was a danger that that information was about to be leaked another way. And so they got ahead of the story. They took control of it and, and sort of took control of the narrative. I think you're giving too much credit to the uh, people around the royal family. I think yeah. certainly when it comes to William... I haven't done that before, <laughs> yeah. as you know. I think certainly when it comes to William and Kate, what we've seen over the past two months is that their advisors and their media machine are, are amateurs. Yes. And they don't know how to play the press or the public. Yes. I think there's been some really, really critically poor crisis management yep. by Kensington Palace in this whole episode from start to finish. You know, whether it's trying to keep the privacy of the Prince and Princess of Wales, whether it's leaving this information vacuum and thinking that people will be okay with that, mm -hmm not getting ahead of the curve, not addressing any of the conspiracy theories. Uh, I still believe, and I'll say this, that the Princess of Wales was thrown under the bus in the apology for the, the, the photoshopped picture, yeah. which should never have gone out in the first place. You know, all these things are, are textbook mistakes. If you're teaching a public relations and marketing class, this mm. is a case study of how not to do PR and communication. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, probably I'm giving them far too much credit. <laughs> well, um, with regards to the person or persons who mm -hmm. try to access the data, um, her medical data at the hospital, what's going to happen to them? Well, that's a really good question. Now, in the week leading up to um, the Princess of Wales telling us her cancer diagnosis on March the 22nd, we were told that there was three people that were under investigation. Now, we don't know anything about those three people, but if it's found that one or all or a couple of them managed to access her data, I mean, they are facing criminal charges uh, because that's a, a, a data breach, it's a privacy breach. You know, you have that oath between... Uh, nurses and doctors and patients and everything. Mm -hmm. And if that has been broken in any way, then there could be some really serious consequences. Now, this type of thing has happened inadvertently before to the Princess of Wales when she was in hospital, I think in 2012, when she had morning sickness. And you had that really unfortunate incident where you Ooh. had a radio station called up and tricked this nurse into giving them information. And she was so traumatized by what happened that she took her own life. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. Married mother of two. A really, really yeah. horrible episode. And so, oh gosh, don't want that ever to happen again. But they do take their privacy very seriously. And so they should. Um, so I think whoever it is, if someone has access that information, if they have it in their possession, and if they were going to sell it to the highest bidder, they're in serious trouble. Now, I may be completely naive in this, but the royals are rich enough. I know People like Tom Cruise, I don't know him personally. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I know people like Tom Cruise, even The Rock, and Michael Jackson too, had almost like miniature hospitals mm. on their own personal grounds. Mm. If they need to have an operation done, they could have more equipment brought in and the surgeons and specialists would go there and do that. Mm -hmm. Why don't the Royal Family have anything of anything like that going on? Well, they do have their own physicians and doctors and they do have yeah. a special, they have a, a royal doctor, a royal head of household as it were. But I think for these particular procedures, they felt that the London Clinic, which is a highly regarded or was before yeah. this p potential data breach. JFK had been treated there. Yeah, it's a, Lord high, Cameron. a highly regarded clinic in central London that does some incredible treatment. So they felt that this was the best place for them to be. Uh, but if it has happened that there has been a data breach and it's notable that this data breach was only the Princess of Wales's information and not the King's information as well. I think if that has happened, then they'll have to question about potentially having treatment there going forward. You think they could move to another hospital? 
But where else would they go? What would the other hospital be? Homerton's quite good. Homerton. You know what? They should just yeah go to the NHS. Yeah. That'll show that they're real royals of the people. Don't you know? that. Good, good enough for us, good enough for them. Exactly. Has there been any update on Kate's condition? No, and we shouldn't expect one. We should absolutely not expect one. So initially, back in January, we were told uh, potentially we'll see the Princess of Wales um, over Easter, after Easter, Easter Sunday, we didn't see the Prince and Princess of Wales and their children. We were told that we wouldn't. We did see the King and Queen and other members of the royal family. We shouldn't expect regular updates on the Princess of Wales from here on in. The next one we will get will probably be, and she's back to work at X event at this time. Trooping That's up, how they want it. Trooping of the colours, maybe? Trooping the colour, 8th of June and 15th of June. There's two separate events. I think it's a little bit close, but perhaps, you never know. It also depends, you know, there's no playbook when it comes to cancer, is there? Yeah. It just depends on her treatment, how she responds, and how she feels about getting back into the public eye. Well, Queen Afia Hagen, thank you as always. Thank you. <laughs> You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ. After the break, we look at the rising numbers of small boat migrant arrivals and suggestions to introduce ID cards to track them. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have it was moved another on from that. era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of JJ and it's over here, live on Talk TV. It's now time for Taking the Mic. Now, a Muslim teacher has been banned from classrooms for sharing opinions that were deemed to, quote, undermine fundamental British values. But I'm not sure that was actually fair. I'm a Catholic, so we're not even reading off the same hymn sheet. 
But I'm not convinced the professional conduct panel of the Teaching Regulation Agency sacked Akib Khan for the right reasons. He was an English teacher at Harborn Academy in Birmingham, and the underlying theme to the comments that lost him his job relate to his critique of feminism, where he points out the ways that society today makes it difficult for women to juggle pursuing a career, finding a partner, and having kids. He said, feminism teaches that women are equal and discourages motherhood and being a wife. Islam teaches women are three times more valuable than men if they are good mothers and good wives, and they can work if they want to. He also said that girls should find a good guy to marry and girls in their early 20s find this easiest. Then you'll have the freedom to work or not work. So it will take pressure off of finding a, finding a career and you can choose to do it at your own pace. Those are his words, not mine. The panel heard that he also informed students that they would be replaced by Muslims if they supported feminism or progressive ideologies. He said, if you believe in feminism, if you believe in aborting babies, in man and man and woman being married, if you believe in working until you are 35 years old and not having any children, if you believe all of this stuff, that's fine, believe in it. But I'm telling you one fact, you're going to get replaced by Muslims even faster. They will replace you even faster. Again, those were his words, not mine. In an online post presented to the panel, Khan allegedly shared a news article stating, alcohol ban helps female fans enjoy hassle-free football in Qatar. He captioned the post, White women enjoying life under Sharia, lol. Now let's just think again about all of these quotes. Women standing on their own two feet and pursuing careers and financial independence is indeed a positive feminist idea. But Khan is right that for women that want kids, that's easier as a couple. Is Mr Khan wrong that in the West we encourage women to put their careers ahead of starting a family? Are we guilty of looking down on females who want to be mothers and wives instead of hashtag boss bitches. Watch the Barbie film. Go ahead and watch the Barbie film and then come back and tell me that what he's saying is wrong. As for his comments on the spread of Islam, well, sorry to say, but it is literally the fastest growing religion in the world. That's completely true. As a Catholic, there's fewer and fewer of us left. This, this is a Christian country, but churches up and down the UK are empty. Most of us celebrate Christmas. Most of us just celebrated Easter. I'm sure you went and bought loads of chocolate eggs. I'm sure you enjoyed the Easter bank holiday. But how many of you actually go to church on a Sunday? How many of you went to church this Easter Sunday? How many of you were at church on Monday, Thursday, just gone? Or Good Friday? Or the previous Palm Sunday? How many of you actually did that? Probably not very many. You sit there and complain that there's too many Muslims, but you do little to practice and even grow your own religion. And finally, can anyone argue with the stats from the Qatar World Cup, where there were no major crime incidents and minimal hooliganism, thanks to the Muslim country's zero tolerance for bad behavior and the alcohol ban in stadiums? Female football fans were not subjected to sexism or fear of violence or attacks at those games. So, Mr. Khan, what he said, was it appropriate for the classroom? Probably not. But beneath his comments, there is more than a kernel of truth to what he's saying. And on this occasion, I'm sorry, but the truth hurts. Now, moving on, Keir Starmer is being urged to bring back ID cards if he wins this year's general election to help tackle the small boats crisis. Labour peer Lord Blunkett first floated the idea of compulsory identity documents during his time as Home Secretary in 2001 and thinks it's worthy of fresh consideration. His comments come a day after small boat arrivals passed 5,000 by the end of March for the first time ever. Joining me now is Kevin Saunders, a former Border Force Chief Immigration Officer, Kevin, what do you make of Lord Blunkett's proposal? Good evening. Well, I remember Lord Blunkett's original proposal when he was Home Secretary. And quite honestly, it's a very, very good idea. And I was extremely pleased to see that Stephen Kinnock, the Immigration Minister, um, came out supporting him. It was a little more disappointing when the uh, shadow Home Secretary... Yvette Cooper, completely changed everybody's minds by saying it wasn't going to happen. But it, it's, let's, let's face it, ID cards work. They're a good idea. Everybody should carry them. They're great for working because you can't get a job unless you produce an ID card. So it would do great damage 
to the unregulated economy as well. Um, give them to migrants as well. Um, yeah, a fantastic idea. Right, but people are arriving on our beaches without documentation. What's to stop someone coming across and saying, sorry, lost my ID card in the sea? What, what happens then? Well, you'll have a database for this, a database which will have, no doubt have fingerprints and um, photographs on. So that gets around that problem. So before you get your ID card, you have your photo taken and the fingerprint taken. So you, um, you can only be one person and not two or three. So it's a good idea. I mean, let's face it. Europe has had ID cards since before the old Queen died. And it works perfectly well in Europe. Everybody knows that they have to carry their ID card. And if they are stopped by the police because they've had an accident or something like that, and they're asked to produce their ID card and they can't, then they can be arrested. Good idea. Let's have it. Well, then, but if you're talking about people who are living in, in other countries. So if someone lives in Syria and they're fleeing war or they're coming from, I don't know, Angola, they haven't got their ID cards over there. How are we going to enforce another country to have, make these people have ID cards? They're literally... No, just... if, if, a, if a migrant arrives in the UK, yeah. um, part of the, uh, the package will be to give them an ID card. Now, I would have national insurance numbers on ID cards um, as well. So instead of putting an NI number on uh, an ID card that you're going to give to a migrant, you would put PFA, person from abroad, on it so that they would, uh, that an employer would know that since that person hasn't got an ID card, they can't work. When that person is allowed to work in the UK, then his ID card is changed, he has a national insurance number on it, and he can work. OK, so let's, let's do a little role play. I've just come across from France on a small boat, landed on the beach. The, the, the powers that be take me in and say, we're going to give you an ID card and it's going to enable you to work and it's going to have a national insurance number. Who are you? And I say, I've got no, no identification. My name is uh, JJ. I'm 15 years old. I'd like to be put in school uh, and given, given free school meals. You can't ID anyone. Everyone arrives here, you say, we'll give them an ID card. But you've got no proof of who they are anyway. So we're in the same predicament they're in currently. Right. If, if you're a, first of all, if you're a 15 year old, you'll be given a child's ID card. You would have your photo, photograph taken, fingerprint taken, and that identity would be recorded against the name that you've given us. Unfortunately, we can't control the people that um, don't give us the right details, but we can enter them in, onto the system in the identity that they've given us. Therefore, that identity cannot be used again. And that person, if they're stopped for anything and their fingerprint is checked, then we will know who they, what identity they've given the authorities. Hmm, OK. I understand that. I just don't feel this is going to be a deterrent to, uh, to immigrants coming across. Well, it's not necessarily a deterrent. What it actually is, it stops people from working illegally. And that, that is a big move because... If you turn up at a building site and you want to work, you've got to produce your ID card for the uh, before that they will employ you. It works admirably in France. You can't work without an ID card. So it works very well. And you introduce a fining system so that if the employer on, say, the building site takes somebody on without an ID card and my former colleagues from enforcement arrive and check everybody, then they levy a £10,000 fine straight away on the uh, employer. Yeah, good idea. Now, it's a very good idea. Now, Kevin, what happens um, with, the, with the black market trade? Because, let's be frank, in this country, we've had, we've had actual journalists get confused between Romelu Lukaku and Stormzy. So we're going to have some people coming here who some British people may think, well, yeah, this looks like the guy on, on this card, so I'm going to allow him to work here. And then your mates turn up from immigration and say, no, no, this isn't the person on the card. Here's a £10,000 fine. Setting all of this up is going to be a huge cost to have a massive... to have everyone fingerprinted, or all, all, all of the cloud costs and everything else. It just seems like a huge, massive expense for something that could possibly still be taken advantage of. Uh, 
any any system that you that you uh, use will have people who want to try and get round it. That that's that will happen. Anything we have that with passports at the moment. We have people making passports, British passports, to try and get into the country. That's why we have forgery experts at our airports to check on these sorts of things. And we would have the same thing with ID cards, but people would try and make them and manufacture them. Um, but that isn't, that isn't a reason not to have them. You have them because it identifies you. And that's what we need, we need to happen. We need to be able to identify everybody. And yeah, there will be some people that slip through the net. I'm not saying that everybody, it'll work for everybody, but it'll work for most people. Well, Kevin, I think you're right, actually. You've convinced me. I think it is a good idea. And I think that immigrants will think it's a good idea too. Because what essentially we're saying to people is, if you come to the UK, we're going to give you a card and you can work. You can't find a job back home. Come here any way you want. We'll give you an ID card and a national insurance number and you can work and make an honest day's living. That's, that's great, isn't it? So it's an incentive to make people come here now as well. It, it, it's, it's a very good system and it's very fair as well because it doesn't matter who you are. Um, if you've got a, an ID card with your photograph on it, uh, a national insurance number on it uh, and your name and it's you, it means you can work. It means you're legal. It means you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have any problems at all. Um, there, there is, um, in the national insurance number, uh, there is an a, um, indicator that tells you when that national insurance number was issued as well. So that's a secondary line of, def of defence or offence, if you like. So that's why I would have the NI numbers on it as well. OK, Kevin, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank right. you. You're welcome. You're welcome, mate. So some comments from uh, from the viewers here. Alan has said, hire the Australian Border Force for UK waters as our government are a waste of space. Tom says, send back to France on arrival. France needs to take more responsibility. Uh, Tom M says, how many boats has he stopped? I think he means Sunak. Uh, someone in Parliament needs to ask him. Yeah, well, this is uh, a debate and a topic I think we're going to keep returning to. Now, you are watching The Independent Republic of JJ. At the top of the next hour, we look at the oncoming backlash from the now invisible BBC presenter's pay packet and the mystery artist shaming their council. Don't go anywhere, stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingham City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're that supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Well, good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of JJ. Uh, still got a kick. You're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Coming up, the BBC is still paying one of its most expensive stars, even though he's been suspended and is under investigation. Team GB's gone woke. Fans are left furious after Britain's Olympic team gives the union flag a diverse new rebrand. And the war on Brits abroad. Canary Islands demand a clampdown on families flying over to drink cheap beer, lay in the sun, and eat burgers and chips. Later in the show, we will be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at an inside page from the Sun newspaper. For £150, people will be able to tour the private rooms of Balmoral Castle with afternoon tea thrown in too. Now, don't forget, Balmoral was our beloved Queen's most favourite of all of our homes. Uh, I've never been to it myself, but I think £150, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Under fifty pounds, you get to see her favourite rooms and get an afternoon tea. I'll tell you what, in central London, you might pay 150 just for the afternoon tea alone. Uh, and it won't be anywhere as nice as Balmoral Castle. But yeah, oh, that's a pretty decent deal. If you're a royalist, you're gonna love it. If you even if you're not a royalist, uh, inside of that, that home is absolutely stunning. The Queen spent many, 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 many years in that home uh, with Philip, particularly liking the castle's library, I'm told. Now, the BBC haven't been having a great time lately, have they? They're being called anti-Semitic and biased by supporters of Israel, and then they're called anti-Muslim and biased by supporters of Palestine. And most of us were less than impressed when the Beeb refused to label terrorist group Hamas as, well, terrorists. I'm not even going to talk about Gary Lineker and his overtly political tweeting, but there's one faux pas we can all agree the BBC cannot live down, and that is Hugh Edwards. Hugh was suspended by the broadcaster in July last year after claims he paid 35,000 quid to a young person who sent him explicit images. Now, it's been nearly nine months since he was last on air, and yet he's expected to be named as the BBC's highest earning newsreader. The corporation's annual report is due out in July, a full year since Hugh's suspension, and typically includes the salaries of all staff paid more than 178,000 pounds for the 12 months to the end of March. According to the Times, he is still expected to be named as the newsreader paid the most, having earned up to £439,000 last year, despite his suspension. But why, why are we, me and you, the licence fee payer, still providing this man with a wage? He ain't been on the telly, but he's still been making more money than most of us could ever dream of. Hugh is earning around 13 times, 13, one three, times the average annual salary in the UK. And he doesn't even have to get out of bed to do it, which gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, work from home. Now, Hugh suffered a serious episode after the allegations were publicised, and it's understood that he remains too unwell to take part in the broadcaster's investigation into the claims. But you know what happens if I'm too sick to come here and do work? I don't get paid. I'm certain you wouldn't be getting full pay if you were off for nine months after being suspended for behaviour like that either. All of this is going on 
while the BBC hikes up the cost of our TV licence. Well, I think it's time for a revolution, seriously. And it's time for the Beeb to change the way they do things. Find someone else to sub their big star's wages, because we ain't having it anymore. Now, for more on this, let's bring in the former BBC's royal correspondent, Michael Cole, who knows that newsroom very, very well. Michael, good evening. You worked for the BBC for 20 years. You've now left. So my first question, how much are they still paying you? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Good evening, JJ. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, this is uh, completely typical of the waste and profligacy that is endemic at the BBC. And as you so rightly say, it comes on the day of uh, uh, inflation-busting increase in the licence fee up to £169.50 pence for those of us who pay the licence fee. Others ignore it, more and more of them do so. And it is really quite extraordinary and it is appalling that Hugh Edwards uh, is getting, even before he became ill and he had to leave uh, to his uh, hospital bed or clinic where he is, uh, £439,000. Now, when I was at the BBC for 20 years, for more than a fifth of its existence, the newsreaders were people like Richard Baker and Robert Dougal and Kenneth Kendall and Maurice Stewart. And they were staff newsreaders on a very modest salary. And, and they were very proud to do that job. My old friend and colleague, Michael Burke, uh, said, well, what is newsreading? It's the ability to read out loud. <laughs> and to do it, of course, in a, uh, an air-conditioned studio, very far from the front line, when the reporters, uh, like my, myself, went out uh, and, and got the stories in. And I have to ask, JJ, how does uh, Mr. Edwards feel about this? Because it's well advertised in interviews that he gives that he's a very committed churchgoer. He's a very strong Christian uh, supporter of the Welsh church in, in London. How does he square that with his conscience for taking all this money and doing no work? Because um, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote uh, uh, that a labourer is worth his hire, quoting St. Timothy in the Bible, uh, to get back to the religious side of it. Well, it's OK, a labourer is worth his hire, but what if the labourer is just, instead of using his spade, leaning on it? And that's what's happening. And we are picking up the bill for this because, quite frankly, there is absolutely no reason for the BBC to pay Hollywood salaries because within the BBC, in the regions and in the nations, there are at least 100 people who could do that job, not just adequately, but very well. So why does the BBC have to have this star system? It is completely unnecessary. And of course, that doesn't take into account all the spin-off jobs that uh, Hugh Edwards was getting before he became ill, uh, working for corporations, introducing this, that and the other awards at very, very substantial sums of money. It doesn't make sense. It's reprehensible. And we are picking up the bill every time. Yeah, well, look, Michael, let me tell you, sitting in a TV studio that's well air-conditioned, reading out loud, drinking whiskey, it's harder than you think it is, all right? It's a lot harder than you think. But do you think Hugh Edwards has been overpaid all of this time? <laughs> I, I've, done, I've done it, JJ. Do, <laughs> do believe me. I do know a little bit about it. And let me just say, I, I worked for the BBC. My work won two Royal Television Society awards. I covered wars, civil disturbances, riots, uh, and all sorts of nastiness around the world. I was beaten up and put in hospital in, in uh, Belfast. I contracted hepatitis in the jungles of Guatemala during the confrontation with Belize. Um, I was very proud to do that. I was very proud to work for public service broadcasting. And the most money I ever received in a year at the BBC, wait for it, wait for it, was £47,000. I didn't complain about that because I thought that was a fair salary in 1987 for a fair day's work. What I'm saying is it's absurd to pay these salaries because the BBC is bidding against itself. Who else is going to pay these people that sort of money? There is no one out there 
who's going to do that? The BBC in the old days used to create its stars. It didn't pay these people exorbitant sums of money. If people were getting anxious about their contract and being difficult about it, they just went out and they made another star. That's what you did. That's what the power of the corporation was uh, capable of doing. But they're too pusillanimous to, these days to do anything as, as sensible as that. And we pay the bill. Don't forget that. But Michael, 47,000 in the in 1840 is worth a lot more money today, mate. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but how long? Not, 18, been... not 1840. <laughs> not, a, not 1840. 19, 1987. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old, JJ. Come on. <laughs> how long can the BBC keep this going for? How long do they keep on paying him while still demanding that we pay them a license fee? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, I've written in a new book, uh, How Do We Pay for the BBC After 2027? That's when the Royal Charter, which is its license to broadcast, will be renewed in whatever form, if it is renewed. And I've written in this book uh, that the BBC needs to be broken up, it needs to be destroyed in order to be saved. And there's a very good uh, chapter which uh, in that book which explains how that could be done. Uh, and it should be done. Uh, you know, it's a it's a poll tax, uh, the licence fee, that people never voted for and they can't repeal. Nobody ever asked us about this. It's unique in the world. Uh, nobody else, no other country has a system like this. And it's been going for 101 years, the BBC. It's had a jolly good innings. And it's time to say uh, enough is enough. The, uh, the umpire must raise his finger and point to the pavilion and say, 101 not out, thank you very much, retire to the pavilion of your old memories. Because uh, the corporation, the BBC, is unique in the world because it's the only corporation ever set up not to make money, JJ, but to spend it. And because it gets the money in, three and a, three and a half billion pounds a year, it's very profligate and it doesn't take care of the pennies and, and let the pounds take care of themselves. All it ever does is bleat for more, 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 more money. And I know how bureaucratic it was. When I joined in 1968, the BBC, the brigadier running the induction course said there are 28,000 people, staff people in the BBC, only 10% of them are to do with programs. And that included the chaps taking the scripts round into the studio. Today, today, JJ, there are 22,000 people in the BBC. The difference is now, in the old days, in 68, the BBC made all its programmes. Now it buys them in from independent uh, television companies that make them for the BBC, uh, commissioned by them. But what are the 22,000 people doing there? Why are they there? The BBC hardly does any sport these days. It does the news. It does one or two other current affairs programmes, a bit of radio but all the other stuff is bought in. If it had to live in the real world, like your channel does, uh, if your channel had the amount of money that the BBC has to spend, uh, there'd be 10 people for every one uh, that are in your studios and in your editorial offices this evening. Believe me, that's what would be the truth. Mm. Well, do you think the BBC are going to come out and address this? I mean, first of all, just from the workers' perspective, there'll be staff at the BBC earning a fraction of what Hugh Edwards is on, but having to go in every single day and do a, a nine, ten hour shift, a graft, whilst their big star, who is now under a cloud of suspicion, is off sick. So surely the BBC have to come out and actually make a statement about this. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure that I'm sure that doesn't go down very well. But listen, JJ, you're you're one of the younger generation. Do you ever see a young person looking at the BBC? They don't look at the BBC. The 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 people who do watch, the older and the middle-aged people, people like me, that is the demographic the BBC most despises. It doesn't want older people, it wants young people. And the programmes that we enjoy, shall we say, like Antiques Roadshow or Country File, they're now packed with politics, with wokeism. You know, you cannot see a programme on Antiques Roadshow without bringing in slavery in one sort or another. The Country File is all about and knocking the, the government policy on this and that. Well, we sit down on a Sunday evening. We actually don't want that, but we're beaten up uh, with this propaganda because the BBC is a self-perpetuating oligarchy of like-minded liberal people. And they think that their views is the right one and they're prepared to stuff it down everybody's throats. 
Well, everybody else is fed up with paying. If they want to have a station like that, put it on air, make it a subscription channel and see how many people sign up for it. Yeah, well, Michael, as I've got you here and you are a royal expert, can I just ask you quickly about Balmoral opening their, their, the doors for 150 pounds afternoon tea in the Queen's favorite home? Yes, yes, JJ, I am a royal expert, and I think this is a fascinating story. And what lies behind it is this, is uh, that King Charles doesn't love Balmoral. He doesn't like it. Oh, oh. He doesn't enjoy staying there. And whenever he goes to the Balmoral estate, he stays at Burke Hall, a rather nice house, uh, which the Queen Mother, when she was alive, his grandmother used to use. He always goes there with Queen Camilla. And he's been working on this plan uh, to open more of the Balmoral estate to the public. And this obviously is part of it. But I must say, you've seen pictures, JJ, of the castle, haven't you? Balmoral yeah. Castle. If you looked at the city hall in the granite city of Aberdeen, and you looked at it on Union Street, and you looked at that building, and you'd see it was very, very similar to Balmoral Castle. And why is that? Because they were both designed by the same architect. So he feels... <laughs> King Charles feels, feels he's living in the City Hall of Aberdeen. So he was quite happy. For me. This is all true, I'm telling you. He's quite happy for people to come in and spend £150 on an afternoon tea. Well, I hope they, they, they get a boiled egg with it or something special, because that, that does strike me as a little bit per head. That's a little bit rich. Uh, if you went to Harrods or you went to Fortnum and Mason, I think you could get, do it do it for less. Or the Ritz, for that matter. <laughs> I think it wouldn't be £150 a head. In fact, we ought to go and try. We'll try them out one day and see how much they how much they cost and and how they compare with the the afternoon tea at Balmoral Castle. Michael, that is a great idea. I could talk to you all evening, but I've got to move on. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Now, mocking placards have appeared across a town in England, comparing it to the Grand Canyon due to the number of potholes on the roads. Could it be the legendary Bristolian street artist Banksy? No, actually, it's even better. It's the Daventry Banksy. The anonymous campaigner has hand-painted boards across Daventry in an effort to shame West Northamptonshire Council. Unlike her namesake, Banksy's sassy signs have not yet attracted tourists or light-fingered fans eager to take them home for themselves. However, the signs are usually up for a few hours or days before being removed, presumably in the hands of the council. Not sure she'll beat Banksy's £18 million auction sale record, though. You are watching The Independent Republic of JJ. And up next, the clothing controversy as Team GB rows back on its not very British looking kit. And it's dark days for Adidas with its naughty Nazi numbers. We'll be back in a minute. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of JJ on Talk TV. It's now time for this. The World of Woke. Team GB has been forced into a stunning backflip on its 2024 Olympic kit after outrage from fans. British Olympic Association says a classic red, white and blue kit will be used in Paris after a flag in shades of pink and purple was slammed as diverse and woke. Joining me now is comedian and broadcaster Steve N. Allen. Steve, first of all, the N in your name. <laughs> yeah, what are yeah. you going to guess? Well, <laughs> your name, I've been told reliably, is actually Stephen. And you, yes. and, you, and, and you split the N from Steve to put it in the middle. What is that? Is that for diversity? Yeah, is that inclusion? It was it's not. It's none of those. It's equity, which is not the one you're thinking of. It's the actors' union. <laughs> but, uh, technically, sounds like I'm woke. Well done. <laughs> yeah, it does. Right. What do you make of all of this? Is, is this the right call by GB Olympics to go back to the old flag? It's the only call they could make, really. I feel slightly sorry for them because this, uh, the flag that's upset everyone, has been on sale for ages, and the only, only reason we're so upset is because of the Nike, Nike, however you pronounce it, debacle from the other week. Sometimes I wear Nike kits when I'm going out for a quick bikey ride. No, that's not right. <laughs> um, but it, the team, uh, the the St George's uh, Cross mess up where they decided to change the colours. They went again for a purple and blue hue on the back of the the kit. Now, admittedly, that one wasn't apparently about wokeness. It was an homage to the training kit of the 1966 team, which also is a bit mean, because that means even if England managed to do well at the Euros and win, they won't have done as well as the flag that's on the back of their neck. And it just <laughs> meant that people were ready for any flags that have been messed with. People don't like flags being messed with. People get upset. Otherwise, burning them wouldn't really impact anyone other than Greta. <laughs> so it's a, it's a risky business to change a flag. This one's been on sale for ages, but because of the pushback, they're now saying that there will be the traditional union flag on the outfit. I imagine there's a lot of Team GB bosses having to pull some all-nighters, doing a lot of sewing to get those little flags on the arm so that no one kicks off. I don't get the, the massive outcry with this flag, though, because it's still quite... To me, it's quite still clearly... Uh, the, the 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 flag of Great Britain. It is still the Union flag. Yes, it's been messed around, updated. It looks kind of futuristic, but this is not the flag that they'll be hoisting up when we win gold. When we're here in the national anthem, yeah. when we're standing there proud. But we'll use the actual Union flag. We won't use this one. This is to shift merchandise, and that's what we've got to do. Yeah. Make some dough. That's exactly... Well, I don't know. I feel it's the wrong people making money out of this. Somewhere there'll be a design team who quoted a million pounds and just have to justify why they need that much money so they've redesigned the thing that no-one needs to redesign. But by redesigning it, that means you can copyright it, so I'm sure it means you can't have replica kits just knocked out down the market, not as easily as if they were just using the standard colours. So that feels a little bit cynical that they're doing this for no good reason. You can have a perfectly good-looking kit with the original colours maybe change a hue of the red or the blue could be the uh, a surprising one. But to do it that much, you're right, it's so they can put it on water bottles and flog stuff to us that we don't particularly need. Now, when Nigel Farage was in charge of UKIP, when he was their leader, he bastardised the union flag. 
and he made it this weird purple hue in line with their with their pound shop logo. So what was that okay? But now he's outraged. I know you're, you're, you're mates with him. I know he's one of your mates. Why is he so outraged oh, yeah. about yeah. this flag being changed? But, but it was okay when he changed the flag. Yeah, I mean, part of the defence, I, I do think it's hypocrisy to be upset by it. It's a thing that you shouldn't particularly care about. It's a stupid thing for sports companies to do and cynical for the money. But to be too outraged by it feels like you're doing that just for effect. Um, political parties, though, do have to stick to their colours, I suppose. So uh, most political parties at some point will have a leaflet that tries to use the flag and they'll do it in their own colours as well. It's a bit easier if you're the Conservatives or Labour because at least you're already on brand. But if you're a bit late to the political party and end up with a purple then what else are you going to do um but yeah to, to loads of people try and redesign the flag and put it on their merchandise people people are only upset about this because of the um st george's cross thing the other week though because these items have been on sale for months and no mm. one cared because we all saw what it was as you say merchandise flogging but now we're hyper vigilant anyone messes with any sort of cross and we're going to kick off yeah but actually on that point why do some countries get their flags changed like this and not others, because this ain't gonna happen in Saudi Arabia. You go to Saudi Arabia and they say to the, the Saudis, good news guys, we've changed your flag, this is a rainbow, how you like that? It ain't gonna happen. Rain <laughs> rainbow, <laughs> yeah. bold choice, yeah. I mean, there, was, there are some flags you couldn't do it to as well. I mean, changing the color of a flag, if you were like, hey France, here's our idea, we're gonna use your tricolor, but we're gonna go for gold, red, and black, and oh, it looks like Germany won. So there are some <laughs> flags that don't have enough of a design, they are basically just colors. But I suppose with a Union uh, flag, it's such, it's such a pattern that is so rarely copied that you, as you say, you know what they're aiming for, but it does come across as a bit of a swing and a miss. Purples and pinks, what is this, the Teletubbies? Yeah, it kind of feels like uh, in, in Britain at the moment, we as a nation are starting to feel like we are under attack from everyone. And even these companies, whether it's Nike or Adidas, it feels as if they are all trying to stop us from being proud to be British. And they're slowly changing the flag. St George flag's changing England kit. This flag's changed for GB. And I think the public actually just had enough. And it's like, nah, just leave our stuff alone. We, we like it as it is. Yeah. I think we're making the wrong decision as well, because it is true to say, certainly for the St. George's flag, the St. George's cross has a bit of an interesting past and it has become synonymous with racist groups. But don't let them win. Don't be like, what's that? The yeah. racist groups like that flag. Let's never use the flag again. Let's give them more flags. No, reclaim the flag. Ha have it on your kit. Be proud of it and you'll water down the impact, the negative impact in the past. And the same is not necessarily true of the good old fashioned Union Jack is that the Union flag is not quite as synonymous, but I think the, the sports companies are doing the same thing, aren't they? They're watering it down so that, f that a certain group of people won't push back. Well, those people shouldn't be pushing back. You sh we should be reclaiming it from any sort of group that you don't want to own your flag. Steve, you're absolutely right. After the show, me and you, out tonight, let's get it tattooed here on our faces. Now, moving on slightly, <laughs> Team GB isn't alone in being forced into a kit change, with the German football team announcing the number four on its new jersey will be redesigned amid claims it bears a striking resemblance to the logo used by the Nazi SS units. Steve, it's quite clearly a homage <laughs> to the SS, no? Is it? <laughs> what were they I, thinking? Yeah. I mean, if, if you want something that's linked to far right groups, I suppose the SS is one of them. Um, <laughs> I feel really sorry for them, though, for Adidas. This is what's happened, by the way. I was growing up, Nike and Adidas. You knew what you were doing, but somehow <laughs> we've had to rebrand it like Paula Abdul. That was never a thing. Um, but I do feel a bit sorry because it's just an unfortunate font. It kind of looks a bit like it. If you were to italicize them, I suppose it's getting a bit like the S's from the SS. And in Germany, obviously, they are very keen on not having two S's together, which is a tricky language. That's why they have that weird B to replace the two S's. I think that's why they did it. Um, but also, I'm not a football expert, but why have they got 44 players? It well, seems like quite a high up number when you've got 11 men. Yeah, I think the way it works these it, back in the day when we when we were kids, it worked that you had like 21 or whatever, 22 in your squad, and you had to have one of those squad numbers. But these days, players can pick whatever the number they want, pretty much. I think up to 50 um, for for national service. Right. Yeah, that's um, unfortunate. National service is an interesting phrase. <laughs> national for it service. As well. Yeah, that's a good term. But with um, the SS on the back of the Adidas, there. What about the the rock group Kiss? They literally have the SS. <laughs> I mean, granted, two of their members are Jewish, so maybe they get away with it, but they're allowed to do it. Why can't Adidas and, and Germany do it? I honestly think Adidas would have been able to if they hadn't have 
overreacted. If they would have said, look, this in no way has anything to do with the SS, they're not even S's. These are numbers, not letters. But I think they tried to spin it in a way that made it look like they were definitely not erring on the side of favoring a certain part of German history. So in some way, it's been an overreaction. It's, they're clearly not S's. If, if now we have to go through anything that looks vaguely like it has some sort of a uh, an S in it and kick off about letters, then they're going to end up, you know, spending most of their time having to use Tipex. I remember there was one football, I forget, his, I forget who it was, but he wanted number 69 um, on his kit and that was banned because of the, you know, well, you know why. <laughs> I don't, I, look, I'm not in favour of the SS, but I'll tell you what I am in favour of. If anything <laughs> should be promoted in this world. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Now, I'd like to bring back in my panel. Paul, um, will you be watching the Euros and do you think <clears> the, the Germans are racist because of the, the kits, not Germans in general? No, we, we already know they are. No, no. I, don't, I, I don't think they're racist. Uh, th these things happen by mistake. I remember uh, one time we were chatting outside, I used to do a lot of advertising, and I worked for Comic Relief and they used a man called Keith Lemon for their sport relief thing. Yeah, Keith, Keith Lemon, you know him? Yeah, Lee Francis, he's part of our church, yeah. Keith, Keith, Keith Lemon, <laughs> uh, with his dyed blonde hair, his little shorts and his vest, and the first thing I said is, looks a bit like Jimmy Savile. And it hadn't occurred to them. Like, oh my God, they had to change it all and get somebody else. And I, I just don't think it occurred to them. You know, <laughs> they, 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 it, you wouldn't do that, but you wouldn't, because not only that, they look a bit like half a swastika as well because of that. <laughs> it's just a terrible mistake, a terrible font, and they've just got to rectify it, haven't they? <laughs> they, they you know, they've made a mistake. They're not racist. They, they've just been silly. Steve, you're still there. What, what do you think of that excuse? They're not racist. They're just silly, huh? <laughs> yeah, they just use the wrong font. They yeah. should have done, gone with Comic Sans. Everyone <laughs> loves Comic Sans. Can't, get, can't, can't go wrong with this. so right, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Steve, thank you very much for your time, and uh, goodbye Thanks. for now. <laughs> Gosh, good grief. Um, so, boys, yeah. let's move on to the, uh, the headlines. Four-week waiting lists for GP appointments. Um, where should we start? Mike, you want to explain this one? Well, we've got to look at the fact that NHS um, dissatisfaction, patient satisfaction rates have never been lower in the history of the NHS since this has been measured. And, of course, primary care is the gateway to care in the NHS as well. And we've seen today it's not just um, people not being able to access an NHS GP. We're seeing record numbers of people turning to private GPs as well. They can get through their work. But it's not a replacement for being able to access a GP appointment. And the 8 a.m. scramble was something that Labour's pledged to end by investing in technology and better telephony as well. But the simple fact is, JJ, that there's going to need to be more investment and more primary physical GP surgeries built because many of the structures built are very old. You know, they're old houses. They're centres that were built 20, 30 years ago that weren't built to last. And I was saying to... Um, Paulish before we came on air that you know, if Boris Johnson had committed to building all-purpose health centres in every community in this country rather than 40 new hospitals, he might have done the NHS a bigger favour because more people need to be treated out of hospital settings, not in them. Ryan, is this just a bit of an exaggeration? I've never had to wait four weeks for an appointment. Maybe I'm lucky, but I do live in central London. I'm literally in zone two. If I, if I go on the computer, because it's all done via the computer now, uh, which, which confuses me anyway, but normally I get a call back within two days and I'm seen. I think it kind of depends what you're going to see the G GP for. And I think if you phone up... Chronic so, handsomeness is not yeah, what you have to, you have to go for. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I think if you're going to see a GP and you say, this is, this is urgent, um, they are, and you, you, you tell them your symptoms, um, they are pretty keen to get you in straight away. You know, I've got, I've got two, two young children. Um, every time we've been to see the doctor and said, look, whatever is wrong, they're very keen to get children in to see them and make, give them the all clear or send them to, you know, wherever they need to go to next. Um, so it kind of depends what you are. Some things you might need to see. It doesn't matter if it takes a month. If it's, if it's urgent, you'll be getting and, you, and you'll be get seen. But I think the trouble is a lot of the areas, they have, you know, what they call these GP deserts where you can't actually get to see um, anyone at all. You know, you might have to travel miles and miles and that's not particularly helpful if you are vulnerable at risk or, um, you know, you're elderly and you do, you do need to get try. It's also comfort, isn't it? You know, if you are, you know, you are getting on a bit, um, you want to know that you've got a GP around the corner. Yeah. Paul, what's your experience with GPs? You're like a man who needs to see a doctor many, many times. I, I don't know, G G <laughs> GPs, um, I don't know where they get the receptionists from, but I've, I've lived in many places and, and they're right. a breed, aren't they? Yeah. You, know, you are, I you're right. I suppose they, they, they do get... Um, have, have to deal with difficult people. I went out with a girl once and her mum was a bit of an old bag and um, 
<laughs> now, she was a, G, uh, a GP. This is, I can just imagine her being horrible and patronising to, to all the sick people. But um, I, I've been fairly fortunate. I, um, I think if it really matters, just go up there and sit it out. They're not yeah. going to chuck you out. You say, yeah, call the police, but I need to see someone. But as you say, when it's vulnerable people who can't, you're not in a position to go up there, it is difficult. And how, how has it come to this? Yeah. Like, we that's... give you billions of pounds. Where is it? Yeah, well, I you think know. the trouble is you then have the knock-on effect. If you can't go and see a GP and you are f feeling desperate, you'll then go to the a local A and E, mm. and sometimes A and E just sometimes isn't isn't the right place to go for, for for a lot of symptoms. You do you know just need to go see the doctor, and that's why the government have brought in these reforms where pharmacies will now be able to treat a lot of a, a lot of people. So. I, th I think you just kind of need to, to find your, you know, the right place to be seen. But the trouble is, once you, if you are feeling ill, you have an ill relative and an ill child, you kind of get want to get seen sort of there and then. That mm. that that's the sort of the sort of tr trouble and the sort of point you've got to find your your right point on the in the system, really. Mike, what about those people who call up the GP for every tiny single thing? They wake up with a sniffle, they're calling the GP. I've got to come in and see. You. No, I can barely breathe. Well, we've got there's a... a lot of those kind of people about. Well, yeah. look, you know, we we live in an age now where there's a great online resource now. That for non-emergencies, you're encouraged to ring 111. And we saw this during the pandemic as well. You know, lots of GPs moved to telephone appointments as well, but they didn't have the structures to accommodate that too. If you're concerned for your health and you need to go and see a doctor, you should be able to see a doctor as well. There are ways of looking online to check symptoms. Yeah, the NHS actually does have, the NHS app has become increasingly user-friendly over the years. But a digital health offering doesn't suit everyone. I think a lot of people still want that face-to-face -face interaction, now, particularly among men, for example, generally speaking, um, you know, men do, don't tend to go to the doctors as often as women do. There tends to be more of an issue, particularly when men get older with some things like finding diagnosed certain for prostate cancer. They tend to just try and soldier on. So it might seem like a little thing at the time, but it could end up being quite a serious issue if it's not checked out. And I think a lot of people tend to be perceived as hypochondriac. So there's also a cultural issue as well. And if you can't get a GP appointment and you know, you have to, you've been told to wait four weeks, there'll probably be a lot of people. And there's a reason that we have increasing long-term rates of sickness in this country as well. It's gone up by over half a million, 600,000 since 2020. I think a lot of that is people did put off going to the doctor for issues during the pandemic. And that has an impact on our population health overall. And that mm. affects our productivity, our prosperity and our well-being as a society. We were put off from going as well. We were, yes. Yeah. But they they backtracked, remember, they, they they couldn't put the GE back in the bottle quick enough when they realised that the dangers they initially yeah. thought about the NHS being overloaded weren't going to happen. And there's just something about face-to-face -face contact, particularly exactly. with healthcare. You could just it, tell, by the way, and then, oh, while you're here, we'll just take your blood pressure. And exactly, you can't yeah. do that on Zoom. I don't know. They've got to get this back. Just do what I do. Google your symptoms. I've got a headache. What's wrong with you? Mm. You've got a brain tumour. And yeah, it's much faster and Done. easier. <laughs> Done. But Ryan, um, we are seeing a trend amongst young people. 18 to 24 year olds, almost half of them, are turning their backs on NHS and GPs and are willing to pay instead to be seen privately. Yeah, I think if you, you know, if you are lucky enough and you get, you know, you're well paid enough and you, you haven't got the responsibilities, uh, you know, life, life is expensive, but people think they can, you know, spend, I don't know, I've got no idea actually about how much it costs, but arguments say, say it's you know, 25 pound, 50 pound, or, yeah. you know, or maybe your work, work can pay for it, or you know, through, through insurance or what have you. So some people are caught up in that and, that, and, they, and they will take advantage and people you know, want to be healthy and you know, that if you can be seen quickly and you can afford it, you know, so, much, so much the better. But the trouble is you know, you want to have a universal healthcare system that helps everyone and it, you know, it's really quick and people can be seen as quickly as possible. And you know, it's all right if you can pay for it, but if you, if you can't, that's where, you know, Look, that's why we look to the politicians and the healthcare, you know, people to actually uh, step up and provide that service. Well, they, speaking of politicians, could, sorry, go on. So they could charge. I can't remember which country does it. Um, they charge you twenty-five pound, and it's refunded if you turn up, and that really oh. does stop. And the other one is post-dated prescriptions. Um, yeah, you're all right. We, we, we'll give you. We'll give you this. Um, if you're not better by Thursday, that's got Thursday's date on it. Take the uh, take it and get a prescription. And more often than not, by Thursday they are better. They don't use the prescription, they don't use the resources. Oh, little things, but, little things. The politicians, they have looked at it. I think Rishi Sunak has looked at it, you know, or, or an idea of actually charging people if you don't, don't turn oh. up. But it's always created such an outroar that... Um, but missed know. appointments are a huge strain, not just on DPs, but on dentists as well. Mm. Um, it's... I've spoken to a lot of dentists who said, you know, often that they've been frustrated with wanting to offer NHS appointments and they've had, they've had in certain areas, people just have booked it but haven't been in there. So it's not necessarily a bad idea. I think we do have limited resources in the NHS and 
the end of the day, if people want to be able to use the GP, they should be able to turn, at least turn up for it. And, and mm. Because there'd be somebody there who wants to wait to have that appointment. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Ryan, as a political chief, um, tell me about this serious story. We're going to war with Tenerife. Yeah, I, I, I was, <laughs> exactly. I, I think um, Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, is about to get a phone call, actually, on this. Um, extremely serious story that um, the people in Tenerife actually want a better quality of tourists to turn up. They, 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 they don't like it. There's signs on the wall in English and Spanish saying, you know, no turista, turisticos or... Tourists or go home. They'll go home. So <laughs> wow. they're just not... Yeah, they're just not... Um, they just don't want us there. So I think it's, they don't mind us probably spending the money if you're, you know, you're well-behaved and you're spending money in the bars and the restaurants and the nightclubs. I think it's seeing people lying on the streets at three o'clock in the morning when you've come out of a nightclub and, it, you know, and then you've got the clean-up operation the following morning. It's just, you know, it puts their rates up. And, you know, I also read that the, um, there's a lot of people getting fined because they don't actually want to take on British and Irish uh, tourists turning up in, the, in their holiday homes. So well, You talk about um, Brits being drunk and disorderly. We've actually got video footage of you, Ryan, here, oh, smashed in Spain. Oh, I'm no. joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> it doesn't slightly, exist. It's slightly does. worried. <laughs> Anything's possible with that's AI a, these days. That's a long time ago. <laughs> it's a deep fake, don't worry. Mike, uh, if they want better behaved Brits not drinking cheap pints of beer and eating fish and chips over there, why not just not serve uh, poor, cheap beer and stop serving fish and chips? Stop making it so inviting for us. Put the prices up. I mean, this is the trouble. So many people have been through cost of living squeezes. You know, being able to afford a holiday has become, you know, a rarity for so many people now. And, you know, if you go away and enjoy yourself in the country, of course you should behave respectfully and, you know, you are you are effectively guests in that country as well. But I also feel I can't moan too much about tourists because, you know, I, I rant about them as when they're wandering around the west end of London. They've got these crocodiles of, you know, school children going everywhere and you're trying to get through Leicester Square. That's why I don't go to Leicester <laughs> Square because it's blooming horrendous. But, yeah, you know, but it's, 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 it's interesting, isn't it, that these countries now feel, obviously, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, they wanted the tourists to come back and now certain people feel they can be prescriptive about it as well. So if they feel they can be cheesy about who they want to go without threatening their livelihoods, Fair enough. But as you say, they can get fined for turning away. It's essentially discrimination if they say, right, the Germans, you can come and pay the same as the Brits, but we're not, but we're not gonna have the Brits at all. Paul, that is just deeply unfair. Oh, and deeply unfair. a little xenophobic, might I add. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. The problem they used to have was it was the Germans years ago. <laughs> because It's always the Germans. Because what it was, was the British middle classes used to earn about the same as the German working classes. So you've got oh. The German factory workers, and that's why they thought the Germans were so rowdy. But I'm with you in London, um, Mike, because it's not so much the foreign tourists, it's, this is such a London thing to say, but you're a central... <laughs> um, it's the people from the outer suburbs yeah. that come in for the day. Yeah. Now, I used to go to the West End from a 12 or 13 in half term yeah. with my mates. Now it's the whole family. Yes, yeah, everybody. Half uh... term dad with his phone. <laughs> <you know, laughs> three kids around, yes. Yeah. And you find them wandering around Soho and, and, and Notting Hill and short places. <laughs> and part of that's the internet. Hey, hey, let's go and have a look at this bar. And you're, no, <laughs> go away. Um, so I have a little bit of sympathy from that point of view with the Tenerifians. <laughs> but, but Ryan, it's, it's not just Tenerife. Uh, last year, it was Amsterdam were saying that they don't want the Brits anymore. I remember when I was a kid, it was only English football fans who were who were disregarded and told, "Don't come here, you hooligans." Now it's just English people, full stop. Where or whether you're black, white, Asian, if you're British, you've got a British passport, you are a troublemaker. <laughs> This is extremely unfair. It is extremely unfair. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, ninety-nine point nine percent of people are, pretty, you know, are pretty well behaved. It's that that small majority. So I think, you know, perhaps they need to, you know, grow up a little bit and uh, realise that we're not, you know, we're not all the same. Yeah, but these statues are going to go somewhere, aren't they? I mean, you know, if they don't go to Prague, you know, they're not going to stop. They'll just descend on some British seaside resort and cause havoc here at home. Well, that, that's my, my my final question on this one. Actually, is this going to come to anything? They, they think by complaining about it in their local Spanish rag that we're going to stop going there for cheap holidays and cheap booze. I can't say, no. I think people... I mean, how are they really going to stop people from, from turning up? Unless you, you know... You, I mean, it's not, not, not exactly freedom of movement anymore, but unless you get know, <laughs> someone, you know, stopping them at border control or not selling tickets in this country or what have you, it's, it's just not yeah. happening. No, it's just breathalyse everyone before they get on the plane. <laughs> there we go. Oh, but that, that is annoying. You get on a plane to those kind of <laughs> countries, and when you land, everyone goes, yeah, we made it. <laughs> you don't get that on a flight to Dubai, mate, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> Mike, tell me about water shortages. What's going on? So, um, despite the fact that we've had some, well, unusual weather patterns, you know, 
we've had quite a lot of rain. Uh, we're still heading for uh, water shortages again this summer. And obviously, we're doing this in the southeast of England. How, how on earth is this happening? We've had too much rain and we're having water shortages well, it's still. Partly to, I won't, basically, it's partly to do with the level of the water table in the ground because we've had several dry years previously. The water oh. level's fallen and because the ground's hard, it doesn't soak up the water too. And also, we have increasing populations. There's a, a large amount of waste that occurs from a very badly managed uh, privatised water system mm -hmm. as well. If you want to make a case for nationalised utilities, nationalising water, if they could get the investment right and stop the, the leakages would be great. But the big issue is the weather has been so bad. And even with all the rain, because the ground's so hard, it doesn't soak up into the ground. It just runs off back into the rivers of the sea and generates further shortages as well. So, Paul, is our water industry defunct? Um, I, I hear terrible things about the um, privatised water industry, and I no doubt they're true. But being the uh, senior member of the uh, panel, <laughs> I, re I remember what it was like before that. I remember British Rail. I remember uh, the post office doing telephones and things like that. And, and you think it, it's, it, it it's, it's better now than it was then? Um, I don't. I didn't really concern myself with water when I was a child. <laughs> what but, were you doing with your time, you no, loser? Exactly. But, but, I, but, but I, was, I was aware of the trains and the things and the things that didn't work. So I, I just wonder whether nationalisation is a good thing. But maybe, it, maybe we know enough but about it. If it, it comes yeah. with the investment in the infrastructure, because yeah. Thames Water are now saying they're going to raise bills by 40% or potentially go yeah. bust. And, you know, the, it, the it regulator's be, too weak. No, it shouldn't be something you make a profit out of. It's, no, it, it's, too, no, it's, it's too vital. It, 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 you know. If it's run well with a robust regulator, that's fine. But, but the industry fine. hasn't it done is. that. They've created off huge profits. Yeah. And you know, the wastage is... You know, it's, it's, it's massive. It's crazy. We are surrounded yeah. by water. By water, yeah. I lived in the Middle East, in the, literally in the desert for four years, it's never fine. one host pipe ban. No it quiet. doesn't happen. Anyway, Paul, talk to me uh, about beauty. You're a man who clearly takes care of himself. Oh, you say you're the me. oldest. You look, look younger than these two. Yeah. So, <laughs> what, what's the story about Croydon? What story about? Sorry, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> what have I been given? It's, Croydon is Britain's beauty capital, apparently. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, it's, I mean, it, well, it's... Croydon. When we did ads, uh, Croydon, well, they were always research um, new ads to see if they worked in Croydon because all human life was there. Um, all human life. Croydon, Croydon, all man, human life was in Croydon. Uh, they, they were um, not so much now, but um, <laughs> it, it, it was. It could be very middle class, very working class, a lot of black people, or white people. You know, so you you could get a good cross section of people. It wasn't in Croydon. Too far from the office. No, uh, <laughs> and they're always trying to make Croydon a, a city. So I can imagine that um, the people of Croydon are, are up for a few well, facelifts, spray tans. And, they've got yeah, more yeah. Um, yeah. Beauty technicians than than anywhere else. No, I'm sure. Apparently. Um, but I, 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 I used to work in a, 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 as a DJ uh, all around the place, and I remember working in this club in Croydon called Sinatra's. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. I think it's still there. I think with a C, I think. Uh, <laughs> Sinatra's. <laughs> and, and, yeah, it, I, I used to like those suburban clubs because people were very much on parade. They got dressed up for a Friday night or Saturday night, you know. Yeah. And I can well good. believe that Croydon is, is still up and at it and good for them. <laughs> Would you boys ever get a pedicure, manicure, facial? I think I'm quite. I think I'm quite well served in Walthamstow for beauty technicians. Just about yeah. the numbers on the high street. <laughs> yeah, I can't say I've had a pedicure yeah. or a manicure. Though. No, no. My wife has. I haven't. But no. No, well, I can tell you haven't. It's like moisture. It's like moisturiser. <laughs> it, it's good if I get it for Christmas and I'll, I'll happily receive it and use it. But I couldn't buy it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get these well, sort of bad, bad it's beauty so products? Wrong. They give you. No one's going to see me getting a. <laughs> tube of moisturiser in boots, but oh, I can't do that. Ryan, what about you? You've clearly had a bit of Botox. Oh, <laughs> what, 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 what no, 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 no. no. There'll the the be a moisturiser in the sunshine, maybe, but that's... Yeah, that's <laughs> well, boys, thank you very much. What a way to end the panel discussion, talking about beauty. <laughs> mm, <yeah>. Wonderful. <laughs> now, you are watching The Independent Republic of JJ, and in the final part, we dig into all the best stories from tomorrow's papers tonight. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of JJ. Let's take a look at some other stories from tomorrow's papers. So, panel, still here, good to see. The Boys Club, no chicks allowed. Yeah, I'm going to get cancelled. Anyway, <laughs> let's start off with this one. Front page of the Metro. What's all this about? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Paul, it's this me. is you. <laughs> oh, I, I love this. Um, Do you? Yeah, you couldn't tell. There's a man, I love the headline as well, I'm a bid of an idiot. Yeah. He's, um, he's gone into an auction and he's bid against, against himself. He, he's never been to one before. And so the, the auctioneer is saying, uh, I mean, do, I, do I hear 550? And he keeps putting his hands up, not realising that it's only him doing it. Uh, I could see myself doing that. But it, I get really nervous. Things like eBay, I can do the just buy it now if I want it. Because I always think... The person who bids the most is the idiot, aren't they? <laughs> no one else was willing to pay that much. Yeah. And I, I do find it, uh, again, a long time ago, this is a long time ago, um, I went to a car auction down in Fulham in Wandsworth Bridge and to impress this girl with, I was with, I bought a Ford Cortina. Nice. <laughs> um, and I just thought, what have I done this for? I, as, it, <laughs> as it happened, it was, it was perfectly OK, but it might not have been. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. How much you know, was it? I was about 500 quid. But it was, but it was, that was a long time ago. A daily deal. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that was all right because they wouldn't pay any more because they wanted to sell it on. But for me, it actually worked out all right. But it might not have done. So I could see myself <laughs> doing that, this, thinking I'm cool. This geezer was um, with his wife. His wife was there. His wife, Debbie, <laughs> yeah. 60. So he's literally sat there going, I'll pay 50 quid. And the auctioneer goes, 50. Everyone say 60? I go, 60 that's what quid. They do. Yeah. yeah, it just kept going and going. They're, but, they're, Debbie, why didn't Debbie get in there and sit and be like, "Oi, shut up, you idiot! Put your hand down." This is nonsense. Yeah. I so know. he paid over. He paid up to a thousand quid higher than he should have done for a painting. No, yeah, exactly. Uh, you boys, Ryan or Mike, you ever been to an auction and bid way over the odds? Ah, uh, I mean, I can't say that I have, but now I'm quite, I'm quite tempted to know if I'm ever auctioning something to put a mate in the audience to help up the rate a bit. You know, <laughs> yeah. I think I've got a good, I've got a good hack trading. now there. Yeah. <laughs> right, Mike, take us to uh, Balmoral. So this is a rather inter interesting story. So um, Balmoral is going to be opening to a certain section of the public, providing you're willing to pay 150 quid 
uh, a pop to go in for a visit. Um, it's part of a scheme to raise money for the estates as well. Despite the, the net worth of the royal family, there's huge amounts of restoration works needed on the numerous palaces and homes that form part of the uh, the royal family's huge property portfolio. And of course, Balmoral, famous for being, you know, one of the most private royal residences alongside Sandringham, a favourite of the late Queen Elizabeth II. But the tickets went on sale yesterday. There's only, there's only 1,500 left at the time the, the sun went to press with this as well. But interestingly, too, you can go into the room where they've got a nice picture here of, of, of the Queen, the last photograph of her taken just after she met Liz oh. Truss. She's smiling for some reason, even though she's just met Liz Truss, but you know, <laughs> she's still feeling better. But it, for, for people who are interested in the royals and those, a substantial number, this will be a big draw and the cost of the money will go back into running yeah. the estate. But, Ryan, uh, is this one for you? Yeah, I think I, I probably, yeah, save up a little bit, but I think it would be, well, you know, be expensive if you take a family, but um, I, I, you can see it, there'd be a you know, sense of history when, you, when you're walking around. And uh, Arthur Edwards, the, the Sun's Royal Photographer, has written a piece saying here that he, he spoke to one of the ladies in waiting. And one of the things that the Queen always said to everyone was that when she got to Balmoral, went through those gates, she actually you know, kicked her shoes off and actually felt like she was at home. Was so you right. will get a real sense of this is where she went to relax. And you can go in the ballroom, the dining room, you won't be allowed in any of the sort of bedrooms and the private private parts. But yeah, I, th I think it'd be, it'd be fantastic. And I think, you know, people absolutely love, love all yeah. this. And for the real mm. royal watchers, it's probably a bargain. Exactly, well, and you get afternoon tea. I think that's uh, exactly. fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, we're very lucky that our next story recovering was actually written by you, Ryan. Yes. What's it all about? Well, this is an interesting story um, that, that's come out tonight. Um, some audio recordings that have been obtained by, uh, by Channel 4 News. And it involves um, Paula Venels, the ex-boss of uh, the post office. And she knew about this covert operations uh, team that was set up at, um, at Fujitsu. Um, this is what the, the, the tapes obviously allege. And um, she knew that two years before that she appeared before a parliamentary committee. Um, so it just looks like the timings of it may, may allude to the fact that she was aware of certain things happening. You could access these computers, the Horizon system, that where all this money went missing, that she, that she actually um, knew about that. And, um, and why did the post office then carry on with all those, um, all those prosecutions? So what is likely to happen to her now? Well, at the moment, the police are, they are investigating and they've been investigating it since the, the start of um, 2020. So we'll have to wait to see what they come back with. But I think you've got a situation where they could pursue individuals, they could pursue the post office um, corporately, they could pursue Fujitsu corporately. All these things seem to be up in the air. So I think we'll just have to wait and see. So the cops have been investigating since 2020. We're now 2024. Still no one punished, still no one in jail. But hopefully with more good reporting like this from you, Ryan, and your team at The Sun, we can see some justice for these postmasters. It's about bloody time. Thank you, boys. Wonderful, wonderful time with you, except for you. Yeah. <laughs> Cancel. <laughs> that is all from me tonight. You've been watching The Independent Republic of JJ and Shovey. I'm back tomorrow at an earlier time at 7 p.m. Right here on Talk TV. Good night. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh. Oh, it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. 